understand a little bit about what, what makes the cut and what doesn't, um, which is where I'm actually going to more or less start, start my Dvar Torah this morning um, with a Mishnah that, that puts the recitation of the Ten, Ten Commandments in a very different context. Um, the Mishnah, of course, was, was compiled around 200 CE, and it was, you know, the, the thoughts were generated in the centuries preceding that. So this is talking about practice approximately 2,000 years ago in the time of the second temple, at least. Um, and it records that part of the daily prayer liturgy that was said every day in the temple um, was a recitation of the text of the Ten Commandments um, every morning, basically in, in the part of the service leading up to the Shema. Um, and, and back at that time um, in the centralized temple liturgy, uh, the, the Ten Commandments were said every morning as a pretty central part of their prayer service in addition to their, their sacrificial service. Um, and then this isn't recounted in the Mishnah, but basically it was removed by rabbinic authorities who were worried that too many people thought that only the Ten Commandments came from Sinai and not the whole Torah. And so they actually wanted to de-emphasize the Ten Commandments a little bit um, as part of, certainly as part of the daily liturgy, um, but also as part of kind of the focus of our belief system and experience of revelation. Um, and that's something I did not know before. Um, you know, I certainly don't read or recite the Ten Commandments every day, uh, but obviously it's very present in my consciousness and it's very present in our collective consciousness. Um, obviously, you know, if you walk or drive by our synagogue, they are about a story tall right outside, right outside our front door and walking in the room today, of course, as I pointed to earlier, we have the set on top of the ark. Uh, and then when I opened the ark, I, I remembered that even on our Torah cover, we have the little set right here. Um, and you can open this up. I don't think there's a mini set on the, on the Torah inside, but, but obviously this is something that we include very deeply um, into our, into our, ritual lives and our, our ritual identities. Um, and part of that goes back to the very, uh, the, the experiential side of Sinai. Um, of course, there's the very famous Midrash um, that everyone, every, every Jew who ever lived or ever will live was there at Sinai that day um, during, during those events that we read this morning. Um, everyone, everyone was there to hear them. And so these words, that, that experience of revelation and these words that are the kind of tangible representation of revelation are really deeply inculcated uh, into our collective Jewish mindset and identity. Uh, and, and in some ways, I almost feel like the, the, the actual words are of the commandments because I don't visit them every day uh, they're kind of like an old friend, um, someone who perhaps you don't talk to nearly as much as you feel you should, uh, but the minute you pick up the phone and call them, you realize the connection is just as strong as ever, uh, and you can pick up exactly where you left off without missing a beat. Uh, and hearing Sharon read the Ten Commandments this morning, uh, that's, that's generally the way I feel, uh, and it's the way I feel three times a year, as I mentioned, whenever, whenever we read the Ten Commandments. And that, that goes along really strongly with, with the dramatic buildup, right? Uh, picturing the smoke, uh, hearing, hearing the sounds, seeing the sounds, all these, all these crazy sensory experiences. Um, and in our more tangible, you know, right now experience, just standing up in preparation, right? Standing all together, and again, hearing hearing the familiar voice of Sharon uh, and her and her singing and, and recitation of the Ten Commandments, it really does build that association and, and make us feel like we're picking up exactly where where we left off. Um, and in that regard, I like to think of the Ten Commandments and the whole experience of Revelation at Sinai more as something that happened for us as a people, 
uh, not something that happened to us. Uh, perhaps my least favorite Midrash, and this one again is so famous to the point that, that I think many people think it is included in the text, um, is that at Sinai, there, there's, a, there's a Midrash that God actually lifted up the mountain and held it over the people's heads until they kind of consented to accept uh, God's covenant. Um, and and there, along with that is this idea that the covenant needed to be driven or agreement to the covenant needed to be driven by a sense of fear and obligation uh, and not a sense of love and connection. Uh, which is which is why I can do without that very famous midrash, and I want everyone to know very clearly that that is not anywhere in the actual text of the Torah. Uh, instead, I prefer a modern and, if not midrashic, then maybe psychological take on the events at Sinai, which is put forth by uh, the great the great modern Bible scholar, Doctor Aviva Gottlieb Zormer. She writes that the purpose of revelation is to develop human qualities. What is enacted at Sinai is the revelation of the human being in larger range and strength. A new consciousness is born in this revelation. The Israelites endure an initiation that ensures them against the extremities of history. God comes to Sinai so that the human may come fully into its own. And I think that's where the power of the Sinai experience truly lies, in the covenantal bond formed on that day. This bond elevates the people while also binding God firmly to us. Nahum Sarna emphasizes that this is a living reality an actual legal circumstance. Covenant consciousness suffuses all subsequent developments. And maybe that's what it means that we were there at Sinai on that day, that we've never wanted to or been able to move away from that, that that covenantal consciousness is so suffused into, into our identity as the Jewish people um, that, that it is inseparable from that identity which I think ties nicely in to, that, to the short coda at the end of the Parsha, uh, not the part about not approaching an altar in nakedness, that's the coda of the coda, um, but, but in the verses before, make for me an altar of earth in every place where my name will be mentioned. Uh, Revelation was never supposed to be a one-time event, and it was never supposed to be the end-all be-all. Rather, we were supposed to take the word and the experience and live it. Truly bring the covenant into the lived reality and bring it into the space, spaces and times of our everyday, not just leave it behind at Sinai.